Okay. Elizabeth. I'm here. Hi. Hi. Hello, Hi. everyone. Hello. Hi. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Learning Space. Uh, my name is Nicole Gallucci with CosmoQuest, and I am joined by my co-host, Georgia Bracey. Hmm. Hello, everybody. Hi. And we are joined by Elizabeth. Damn it. <laughs> no. <laughs> forgot how to Hi. pronounce your name already. I forgot how to pronounce your name already. It's Elizabeth Kinnearum. Kinnearum. We worked together, and I never said her last name, and so I'm like, oh, my God, I don't know actually how to pronounce that. <laughs> All right. I won't hold it against you. <laughs> I'm sorry, Elizabeth. Kinnearum. 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 Um, welcome <laughs> to the special Mall Day episode of Learning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I know. It's exciting. So, uh, yes, yeah, so last week uh, we were both, Georgia and I were both kind of out of it, and so we had to cancel. So thank you for hanging with us there. <laughs> This week I have the worst concred of all concreds, at least for me. <laughs> Hang on. <laughs> oh no! Damn it! You will now oh, demonstrate. Here. Demonstrate the concred. I'm gonna. I'm, <laughs> oh my god! I'm so gonna rely on Georgia to use the phrase because mine isn't working. Um. Yeah. So I have concred. I just got back from Geek Girl Con, which was amazing. We had a do-it-yourself science zone that was organized by uh, Dr. Rubidium and a whole bunch of awesome people. Science is her name Rubidium? Scientists. No, her name is not Rubidium. Oh, <laughs> I was like, that is awesome. So jealous. I know, I know. That's why I was like, what? No, Dr. Rubidium is, is her Twitter handle. Um, but uh, she uh, ran that and had that going, and we had a whole bunch of scientists who were helping kids do hands-on science projects for two days straight, and, and I got the con code as a result, but it was totally worth it, so yay. Um, so we're back and on track. Um, so today is Mole Day, and we have with us our esteemed chemistry teacher colleague, Elizabeth. <laughs> Elizabeth used to work with us at the STEM Center at SIUE and is now teaching how many chemistry courses? I only have four sections of regular chemistry. Okay, only four sections. That sounds like a lot to me. Oh, it's better than five or six, but okay. we have double lab periods twice a week, so I get my kids all the time. So Awesome, awesome. Only four. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, as usual, we will be taking your comments and questions during the show. Uh, you can use the Q&A app, the new-ish new Q&A thing for Hangouts. Um, I will try and remember to check that. Um, you can use the YouTube page or the event page as well. Uh, I'll be checking those sources for comments and questions along the way. Um, so we are going to talk a little bit about Mole Day because it is 1023. And, and Elizabeth, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what the heck a mole is and why 1023 of all days would be called Mole Day. Sure, I would, I would love to. Um, so today is October 23rd, and we actually just missed the official Mole Day celebration because it's 6.13 and uh, it ended at 6.02 p.m. But Mole Day is super important in the chemistry world because we like to count atoms and molecules and all those little bitty tiny baby things that we can't see with our own eyes. And in order to do that, though, we need to have... Um, almost like what I explained to my kids as a conversion factor. We need a way to get from counting atoms, because um, they're so little, we need to get away from counting them to having a unit represent them. So a mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles is equal to one mole. And so a particle is our atoms or our molecules. Um, so it's just a good way for us to count them without having to sit there and go one, two, three, because atoms are so tiny and they make up everything in matter. So if you think about mole day, it's on the 10th month of the year, so 10, and now we are on day 23, so 10 to the 23rd power, and then the celebration is technically from 6.02 a.m. to 6.02 p.m. So that's the mole day in a nutshell, and it's been a, it's been a fun day for the chemistry nerds of the world, that's for sure. Yeah. Do you know how long it's been celebrated? Anything? I I do not know how long it's been celebrated. Okay. That's a, a very good question. I know that it's celebrated it's years, around the world. Yeah. So. Okay. But this is the first year I've heard of that time restriction. Six o two to six o two p.m. I just learned that today, and I thought, darn. You know, yeah, learning space is not quite there, but you know, time zones and all we can. Exactly. Find yes. Yeah, if we think about time zones, we, we still need it, and it's all good. We are still 6.02, yeah. <laughs> so that's great. 
So you celebrated big time in your classroom, it sounds like, today, Elizabeth. Right. You started uh, at 6.02 a.m., I believe. Well, before, it seems, but it, yeah. It did. Um, so this was a chemistry-wide celebration at our school. We have 18 classes of chemistry, and our AP wow. classes actually put on this event, and it's called Molympics. And we celebrated it with our kids by saying you have to be at the gym at 6.02 a.m., which, of oh, course, they're all crying on the inside. Um, and they're not used to getting up that early, so it was funny to see them groggy and stumbling in. And each class, so it wasn't just all of four of my classes, it was all chemistry teachers' classes. They had a certain color, and they came in, and they had team captains, and they had to sign up for different Olympic events that uh, – were just actually hilarious. Um, they had crazy names like Avogadro's Roll and a Molada yeah. and a Molzo Throw. It was just, it was a good celebration for them to think about why are we here at 602? Why is it on 1023? And what exactly is a mole? So it was, it was hilarious to watch them do all these things. Awesome. So tell us about one of those events. Pick one that you thought was the most awesome. Oh, my favorite, my favorite was to transfer a mole of water relay. So there was two boys and two girls uh, per team. So you have all of these kids lined up across the gym. And just like any other relay, you had to transfer uh, a baton, I guess. In our, in our case, it was a pipette. And they had to wear safety goggles, otherwise they got disqualified. And they had to transfer water from one end of the gym to the other. And they had to transfer 18 milliliters of water because that would be equivalent to one mole for them. Mm. And it was hilarious. Pipette by pipette, they had to transfer all that water across the gym. And my kids got disqualified. I'm going to tell you right now. They chose not to wear their safety goggles. And it was so <sighs> sad. But no. I know. But other kids are, like, sprinting. And then some kids are actually accidentally squirting pipettes. So water spewing all over the gym floor and safety hazards. But they made it through. And... It was really oh. funny to watch them and then for them to think about, well, why was it 18 milliliters of water? And so that was that was fun. Oh, excellent. That's so, amazing. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so they got to participate, though, even though they didn't have the goggles. They just... Well, well the funny thing or is... Were they not even allowed? No, they were allowed to, but the funny thing is, is that until they caught on, the AP students who were running all the events, uh, they dumped out the water and told them they had to start over until they put their goggles on and followed safety precautions. And oh. for all of you science people out there, they kept right. referencing Carol from Flynn Scientific's poster. They said, you know what happened to Carol. She can't see anymore. So um, it was it was morbid and uh, hilarious, mm. but at the same time informative for them. So it was great. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have anything involving balloons with a mole of gas in it? This is um, actually a weird year for us. They normally do, but we have a, a kid at our school that is so allergic to latex that we are now completely latex-free because even if something, if a balloon were to pop and he Ooh. was to walk in, he would completely go into an anaphylactic shock. Ooh. So, um, sadly, we could not have balloons. Okay. Not even, like, those metallic ones they fill with helium? Cause that no, would be not good. even. They would have to send in a whole, like... I think it's called a hazmat team to like clean out the gym of all the ridiculous. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. Poor kid. Yes. So he wasn't there today at the celebration, but they didn't want to take any chances. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. But they also had other things. So they could come to the Olympics and I actually had um, 69 out of 90 of my students come today at nice. 6.02 in the morning and compete. But then they could do other things like make a mole, make a stuffed mole. And this year, the official theme is an animal kingdom. So they made all these moles that look like other animals, and it was precious. Oh, my goodness. Yes. It was That's a great awesome. day to geek out in the world, that is for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so what were some of the animals that they made? Um, my favorite was the electric eel mole um, because they went and, like, wired it, and so it lit up the whole mole actually lit up and it would blink. And so that was an electric eel. Um, <laughs> that was just really funny. Then there was... Um, nice. The other good one was instead of Shamu, the whale, it was Shamol. Oh my god. Yeah. Yes. Those mm -hmm. kinds of things just make me laugh, the way that they just got creative about how to make something into a mole name. So we had an, uh, oh. a molephant, an elephant mole. <laughs> um, 
And I want to share one. I don't know if I. Okay. Oh my god! Oh. Look. <laughs> yeah, that those were the cow. Those were uh, a moly cow. Oh, moly cow! Excellent. Yeah, they were moly cows, and she wanted to have a mustache on one and a hat on another. So yes, that is one of the pictures Aww. of my. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> Yay. Yep. There. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so, so a mole, like you said, is is six point oh two times ten to the twenty third, and, and mm -hmm. a, this is a, a a problem that we have both in chemistry and in astronomy is these huge ridiculous numbers. How do you get across the scale of that number to your students? It's really really difficult. Um, so, of course, in scientific notation, it doesn't mean a whole lot to my kiddos. Um, so, what we do is we write it on the board. They have the they have to write it on their sheet. And then they have to, what I had them do was start like finding other place values, th things that they're familiar with. Where's the thousand place? Where is a million? Then, okay, where is a billion? And then when it's a six, when it's six trillion, they just, their mind goes, whoa. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of where we start. We, we look at the number as a whole and then we reference place values that they're used to seeing or um, could be more familiar with. It's really hard for them to wrap their brain around. That's for sure. Um, and today was actually the day that I introduced the mole. It was a nice coincidence that Yay. I introduced the mole on mole day. So we're going to be exploring that concept in the next couple of days by having some hands-on labs um, and practicing doing conversions between grams and moles and moles and molecules and grams to molecules. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be interesting to see how they, <laughs> they take in that information and truly try to absorb it and conceptualize it. So it'll be, it'll be a good challenge. What kind of hands-on activities do you do for, for moles? Oh, for, yes, isn't that a great question for a mole? Um, one of the activities that I will do is I will find different elements for them, and I'll put them in a beaker, and then they'll have to uh, make observations about the elements themselves, or the um, example metals. Maybe we'll give them some copper, make some observations. They'll have to weigh it, and then they'll have to transfer. They'll have to go from grams to molecules and so forth. So that's mm -hmm. one of the ways that they can start to see, well, how much, how many moles are there or how many molecules are there of a sample of copper and so on and so forth. One of the new ones that I just learned about is the bubblegum lab. So how many moles of sugar are in your in your everyday chewing bubblegum? So I've never done that before and we'll have to see how it goes. Oh my gosh, it's probably a big number. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be a big number. So I'm excited to see how that lab goes. First through teaching you get to try all these new fun things and I can't wait. Where did you get the activities? Either one or both. I got both of those activities from two separate teachers that I work with at my school. Oh, I'm good. fortunate enough that they love to share everything, and so they, I was like, hey, what do you do for the mole? And they're like, well, here you go. Here's some mm -hmm. awesome things. Um, one of the other ways that we teach the mole is, like I said, conversion factors. So dimensional analysis is big in high school, and mm -hmm. getting them to be able to convert from one to the other is one of the biggest tasks I've had to face so far. So we've talked about other uh, ratios. What does it mean to have a dozen eggs? Or what does it mean to have a ream of paper? Those kinds of things to get them thinking about, okay, it really just means one mole is this much of mm -hmm. something else. So we've been working on that right now. It's or a murder of crows. A murder of... I don't think it's an exact number. <laughs> it's it's a label. label. It's a label. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Did you involve um, any of your parents in this, or do you know, you know, what their reaction was? So all, you know, all these kids that had to come to school really early <laughs> on this day. <laughs> I assume okay. somehow they obviously found a way to get there. You know, that might have been different from their normal way. Did you talk to parents at all about any of this? Um, the parents, some of them knew about what was going on because I have sophomores through seniors, so not all of my kids can drive. So the parents had to get up and they had to take them to school. Um, and since we introduced the mole today, after Mole Olympics, I'm sure they were still like, well, what's the mole? And the kids are like, I'm not really sure. And they're like, great, your teacher's making you go to this and you don't even know what a mole is yet. Um, but hopefully they were able to explain it to their parents afterwards. And I'm pretty sure some of my kids' parents helped them sew a mole also. So Animal. inadvertently they were included because I'm sure they were going out and buying shirts for their kids or helping them sew a mole. And, um, so it's just a big uh, thing at our high school in particular, and parents haven't been there. Um, but it would be cool to try and maybe see if they wanted to come. They laughed. Uh, my, some of my students said their parents laughed when they told them they had to be there at 6.02. <laughs> They say I good can luck. imagine. 
You would have to provide coffee if you were going to involve the parents, I think. I think that, that would be mandatory, yes. Many, many moles of coffee. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So many moles of coffee. That would be needed, most definitely. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Cool to do. All right. So what other kind of um, so so of course you worked in the STEM Resource Center, which is like the happy 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 fun place of all the science demos you could ever want. I feel like right <laughs> when I first um, moved in there, and and so how do you bring that into the classroom now? Your first year as a full time classroom teacher, what other kinds of hands on demonstrations do you do in chemistry without I don't know blowing up the whole school? <laughs> or yes. Something? Um. So day one we ended up doing a whoosh bottle demo. Which is honestly just a five. I remember you practicing bottle. that. You have. I remember yeah. you practicing that. Oh yeah, because yeah, the there. first time I burnt my arm hairs off. That was great. Yes. yes. Uh huh. So um, tell us what that is. So Please. the whoosh. Yeah, sure. The whoosh right. bottle demo is uh, a five-gallon jug of, well, just a five-gallon jug that normally has water in it. The ones that you see on the awesome water dispensing machines around in offices a lot of times. Okay. You can buy them at Walmart. Uh, for I think it was like eight dollars, nine dollars. I'm sure it had some weird sense value after that. But um, so you take one of those, and then I put about 25 milliliters of 70% isopropyl alcohol in there. You swish it around, make sure it gets evenly coated, put a cap on it even, uh, and then you ask students, "What do you think is going to happen right now?" And they are like, they're hoping that the whole bottle just completely breaks and shatters <laughs> across the room. And it doesn't, but it does have a nice whooshing sound, and flames come out the top, and it they go, whoa, afterwards. So that's fun. Um, we did that day one. One of my new favorites is actually the mystery colored sponge demo. So you have two mm -hmm. containers. One's an acid and one's a base. And um, then you dye a sponge with some Congo red. And so when you put a red sponge into a red beaker, what do you think would happen generally? You would think, mm -hmm. well, what it do you think? It looks red? Yeah, it would still look red. <laughs> you put it in there, and since Congo red is an indicator, it turns blue. Oh, you, turn, you put okay. a red sponge into a red solution, and boom, it's blue. And then when you put it into a blue solution, the sponge goes back to red. It's, oh, very cool. It was really cool to get them to start thinking about questions, how to formulate good yeah, questions. Yeah, so they did whoa with that one too, huh? Oh, yeah. Awesome. That led into our discrepant event -thon. So we had a, a whole discrepant event -thon, which Nicole's shaking your head like, I know exactly what that is. I was about to ask what if that ties into discrepant event, and if you could explain that for our audience, what is a discrepant event? So that's a, sure. a term I've learned from the NSTA chapter at SIUE. <laughs> <laughs> So a discrepant event is when you propose something, for instance, like the sponge demo, and you say, okay, what do you think is going to happen? And, Nicole, you provided the perfect example. If you put a red sponge in a red solution, then, gosh darn it, it should turn red. And then a discrepant event blows your mind, and it does almost the complete opposite of what you think would happen. Um, so it gets you thinking about why do these things happen. So a discrepant event-a-thon, they had stations around the, the lab room, and each station had a different discrepant event, ranging from something as simple as oobleck, which is just cornstarch and water, to a density bottle, so that they shook it up and they saw the beads separate and then come back together. They were like, what's happening? Or a ham boiler, the oiler's disc. Um, mm -hmm. my, one of my favorites is the funnel rolling uphill. It, that's a cool one. I've seen that one. The STEM Center has I've it. I've seen that one. It's weird. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. I have to play with that before it gets packed up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's 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 so simple, yet it's one of the most baffling things ever. So Google anyone uh, funnel rolling uphill. Funnel rolling uphill. Yeah, that's things. A lot of these, so many of these things are on YouTube now that you can really just sit there and click away and blow your mind with all these little demos. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Um, so we've done we've done those kinds of things. I love that. I really love going through the scientific process and having them understand that it's not necessarily like step one is this and step five is this. Um, we did an alkyl seltzer lab, so they had little old film canisters, which Sim Center I still have them by the way. Um, <laughs> Don't tell them. <laughs> we won't tell them. <laughs> um, right. Okay. So you just have these film canisters and they have some alkyl seltzer and some water. And they have the challenge to try and get their film canister as high into the air as possible. 
Um, so awesome. they're trying to figure out the perfect ratio. So they have to learn what an independent and dependent variable is. And what does that actually mean when I go through an experiment was really cool. And they realized I can't change eight variables at once. Like, that's just not going to tell me anything. Um, we went through a lot of alka cells for that day, but it was totally worth it. Nice. And then they have to communicate their information to all the other groups. Um, and then they would have to put a Dixie cup on top of the film canister and tape as much change to it as they could. So it was like a payload. And they had to get it into one meter orbit and with all of their class data. And it was, it was funny to watch them struggle with how do I set up an experiment and how do I go back and change it when I need to. And I like doing those kinds of things, things that make them think. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, the discrepant events are really good for that. And you mentioned you um, get them questioning um, things, right, with the mm -hmm. discrepant events. Yeah. Right. So once they've had that whoa <laughs> moment, then, um, you know, they have to start asking questions about what's going on. And you lead mm -hmm. sort of a whole class discussion sometimes, Elizabeth, or how do you, how do you kind of have that questioning go? Yeah, so with the Discrepant event a -thon, it was more of they started writing all these questions down that they had in their journals, and then they, w they were in groups, so then they were having these discussions in groups. In groups. Um, and that, the Discrepant event a -thon really helped us with how do I formulate a good question? What does a good observation look like? And then how can I formulate a hypothesis from those observations and from those questions? How could I test those things? So that's what our class discussion was focusing on, not necessarily answering their specific questions, but mm -hmm. how, like those skills. Um, the most recent discrepant event that I've done with them is the NAS tube, so a Nature of Science tube. Again, if you haven't seen this, your kids are going to hate you for it um, because you, they never get to know the answer. Well, but I was going to ask, do you tell them the answer? Do you, if they guess it or figure it out, do you tell them they're right or do you just like lead them on for <laughs> days? Um, for, for the discrepant event -a it was kind of, since the point was more questions, hypothesis, um, that type of thing. No, I didn't tell them the answer. Um, sometimes it's funny to tell them, you know, in science, sometimes nature never tells. You're never going to know the exact answer. And to, for them to wrestle with that is extremely frustrating. So for the NAS tube, um, I got a little bit more clever than they were. I looked up and Googled NAS tube for them, and I looked at all the possible um, designs, and I tweaked mine so it was different, so I could always tell them, no, that's not it. Um, sneaky. Sneaky. You are sneaky. Good job. And they about threw them out the window. They they loved it. Wow. They would just sit there and play. And um, for those of you that don't know what a Nas tube is, it's a Pringles can with four strings coming out. Um, and whenever you move one string, they all move, no matter which one you pull. And it was fun. It was a great time. We did that as an intro to the history of the atom, trying to study things you can't see. Mm -hmm. And experiencing that frustration, I like. I'm sure the scientists that discovered different parts of the atom felt all the time. Yeah. Do you like super glue the top on so they can never open it up? I do. I put construction paper in the top, like dark construction paper, and then yeah. I super glue it. And then I also tell them that if they open the can with force, then they get points deducted off their grade. Nice. Yes. <laughs> and I do tell them if you ever get the correct answer, then I will be more than happy to say yes, that's it. But I also mm -hmm. tell my kids don't ruin other people's joy of discovery. Don't take that away from someone else. Awesome. And they generally don't. Mm -hmm. They don't tell other kids once I say that because then they're like, they feel proud that they're the one of the few and elite that got it. I guess. So, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. A lot. The secret is theirs for a while. Mm hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. they feel empowered. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. Have, have you ever seen Kathy Costello's discrepant event with the candle? And I'm not going to give it away. With the candle? I don't... Oh, um, is this more about inferences? The one where she eats the candle. Yes. I, yes. I, okay, I, that was about it. Okay. I have I'm done that one. Away. Yes. You have done that one? Uh, but Yes, I've done it, but now with my kids. Okay. Because I wouldn't be able to keep a straight enough face to finish <laughs> chewing it. I, I actually have it on video somewhere, um, and oh, yes, uh, though I, I did bug her for the answer afterwards. She does that uh, for her education classes and doesn't give them the answer, mm -hmm. right? And she doesn't tell them until, she, I guess she didn't tell you until much later what the answer, like she, she will show you this candle and light a candle, she will light yes, it. And she should explain that. I've actually, I know what you're talking about, but I've never okay. seen it done. Well, she's holding, she's, she's holding thing up this until thing. The Answer. She's holding this thing, and it's a can looks like a candle with a wick, and you she lights it, and as it's burning, she's talking about how you make inferences, and she blows it out and <laughs> eats the top of it, and chews it, and swallows it. <laughs> and when you're watching this, you're just like, 
what what just happened? And it tells you something about inferences and in particular about assumptions. Um, and I'm right. not going to tell you guys what it is, obviously, but it's it's pretty awesome when you find out what it is she, that she's done. Uh, so. I wish you would also do it where I've seen someone keep it lit, keep the candle lit, and then bite it. Ooh, you can do that. Yeah, you can do that. You could do it. You could. It's it's it requires some skill, but I have confidence yeah. in the world that that could happen. Yes. Uh, you could practice that. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So it's lots of good stuff. So do you, do you, I mean, this is your first year teaching, but what kind of feedback have you gotten from the students in doing a lot of these hands-on um, and sometimes uh, and inquiry-driven activities? They, after their frustration, they like it. Um, okay. So in a good way, my kids are a little bit spoiled because they hate, 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 like any other, I guess, teenager, taking notes. But mm -hmm. they can't even stand it when we do 10 minutes because it's a lot of, here's some information, now go wrestle with it or go do an activity to figure things out. Um, and so they respond really well. And I have reg regular kids. So I have some kids that have failed math three times, and then I have some kids that they could be in honors chem. So I have a lot of different kinds of kids, and that inquiry allows them to reach different levels of understanding that they need to get to. So my higher-level kids love it. They're like, oh my goodness, they just are like, I don't know the answer. And mm -hmm. for the first time, they're like having to sit there and go, I actually have to think. Like, I can't just make it by. Like, it's not yeah. on a piece of paper written right there for me. Um, which sometimes frustrates them, but again, once they realize the answer, then they feel empowered. And that's been so great to watch them change in that way. Um, so they're definitely responding well. It took some time to get them to that point. But they miss it. They miss having, if they don't have a lab, like, every other day. They're like, what are we doing? What are we? Yeah. So, which was difficult doing electron configuration recently. So. Mm, yeah. Which they still had a lab for that too, but that's okay. Do you have more traditional labs that they do? Or that you do with them? More like traditional chemistry labs? There are some, like for instance the flame test lab that we did um, with the electromagnetic spectrum and um, you can incorporate that with electron configuration. That was a more traditional lab because there's um, almost like coffee stirs, wooden coffee stirs sitting in different solutions and they have to burn them over the fire and they have to watch what color it is and then they wear the special glasses to see the spectrum. So that's a more traditional one where they do have to fill thing, like they have to fill out paperwork as they go and they have to draw conclusions. Um, and so there, there's that. And then they also have lab books at my school that are their own personal lab books. That They'll do a lot more traditional labs probably second semester. Okay. Um, and that's, that's another interesting thing for them. They have to ha learn the skill of following directions. Because sometimes they don't like to do that. <laughs> does not follow directions, does not play well with others. <laughs> right. And then how about their reports? Do they have to do a traditional type lab or uh, lab report and it has to be a certain format, things like that too? Uh, we haven't quite gotten to the traditional lab report yet. I'm hoping that as we do more of those traditional type labs, then we'll start building on that report. We'll have to start small with maybe just doing an introduction and a conclusion and then building on that so they, they get used to it. Um, one step at a time is definitely the way to go for them. So we'll look into doing that second semester. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Great. Uh, so what do you have planned for, um, I don't know, even next week? <laughs> oh. Do you have some uh, more fun activities that you are, are waiting to do? Yes, this, and I'm actually trying something new, a new type of teaching style that I read about in a book from NSDA um, about mastery learning. So I am incorporating that right now with moles. So um, my kids, what they're going to be doing is they're going to be having sessions, as I call them. They have four sessions until they get to a lab. Two labs, actually the two I described to you with uh, the moles earlier. And so what this looks like is I give little bits of instruction and then they have to go through and they have to do work in a, in a packet. And they can work with others if they want and the answers to those are up at the front so they can check to see how they're doing. But mm -hmm. after they finish a particular session, maybe the first session is on molar mass, then they have to take a quiz on molar mass. Um, and if they don't get over an 80%, then they have to go make corrections, study some more, and then come back and take that quiz. So it's alleviating the idea of homework, but it's also differentiating instruction. Because I have some kids that it will take a little, like 30 minutes to understand molar mass, and some kids will have it done in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So once they finish that, they can move on to the next session, which will be converting from moles to grams. Um, and then they just keep progressing, so that way then I can say, okay, Tuesday we're going to have a lab, so you need to be caught up to this point. 
Um, and after a day and a half of doing this, it's amazing to watch them help each other out, to teach each other, and then for me to work with some kids that are struggling and then to work with kids that are higher level thinking. So that's been really neat to see them take advantage of in-class time to learn and to truly learn it for themselves. So next week we'll do the two mole labs, that, the bubblegum lab and the um, different types of metals and finding how many moles are in there. Um, but then also a new lab that I was introduced to for periodicity is you have well plates that represent the periodic table. You have some Play-Doh and you put it in the well plates. And each lab group has a different character trait that you can find on the periodic table, like density or electronegativity. And they have to cut straws, and they have to follow a pattern. And then they can actually see all those trends for each type of trait. Actually, visually, like the straw is sticking up, that electronegativity increases as you go across the periodic table, oh. so on and so forth. So I'm excited to see how that goes over with them, because they're going to have to make a lot of observations. OK. Sounds yeah. like you're more than willing to try new things. Oh, <laughs> I kind of have to at this point. Everything's a little bit new as a first-year teacher. Um, mm. But it, I love it. I wouldn't change it for the world, that's for sure. <laughs> Excellent. Are you incorporating a lot of uh, next-gen science standards stuff into your lesson plans already? I know uh, Illinois is on its way to accepting them. Is that already an issue for you guys, or is that later down the line? Um, I would say right now I'm in survival. To be 100% honest, I am in complete survival mode. Uh, so our our district is fortunate enough to have a curriculum, for sure. And we're also now known as the STEM team, so we're no longer science and math. We are science and math, and as more engineering classes get incorporated, um, they'll be included in that as well. So we're the STEM team, and so we're trying to make some things cross-curricular. And they're going to be looking at the next generation science standards coming up and redoing the model. So I'm going to see that effect more so in the way that... Um, it's structured. So earth science for us is actually getting taken out more. And every freshman will be required to take biology. And then all sophomores will be required to take chemistry. So I'll see an influx of student students in the next couple of years. Um, but as for how to teach and knowing to incorporate more skills, that I think that will come a lot more next year whenever I have a, a handle on activities. And I can focus on those skill building things and the more abstract concepts for them. Hmm. It will definitely play a part. In our cool. and how we teach in the next coming years. Cool. Yeah. So I uh, checked over on the comments and <coughs> I just have a few uh, from Andrew Planet who just finished an online exam, so he came over right after taking a test. Oh, <laughs> hi! <laughs> Congratulations. And uh, Guido Bibra says, "I'm always saying this on Learning Space, but once again, where were teachers like Elizabeth when I was in school?" Oh, <laughs> thanks. I was like, yeah. And I agree, my chemistry teacher in high school was terrible. Um, for someone who like loved science and was in an advanced science program, I just had such a terrible astronomy class. It was, you know, memorize uh, not astronomy, chemistry class. It was memorizing and, and terrible, and we never got through everything we even needed for the state test. So I wish I had you as a teacher, oh, Elizabeth. Oh, thanks, guys. I love it. I'm liking it. I just remember mostly the really traditional labs where you just had all the instructions and you followed the directions, like you say, and right. saw interesting things happen, but it wasn't, you know, you weren't really testing anything new necessarily. And then and then I remember having to have everything written up in a nice particular way. <laughs> Those Which are is, the things I remember. But it was really right. interesting and I loved seeing the different chemical reactions happen. That was always cool. Right. And so the nice thing for me is now I can incorporate Common Core uh, with my with lab reports. Like that will be an easy cross curricular connection also. Mm. Um, yeah. But I can understand that that comment of traditional labs because I grew up in a high school where I actually didn't do labs in chemistry. So I don't know how I decided to be a chemistry major. Wow. Yeah. Um, I loved the patterns, so, so I loved uh, balancing equations and writing electron configurations. And lo and behold, my students do not, um, for the most part. But <laughs> It's so great, and so going through now, I'm working with fabulous people that are giving me these amazing activities and things to think about. They had this whole inquiry-based activity to color the periodic table, and at the end, they could see the S block, the P block, the D block, and the F block. I didn't have to teach them that. They got to do an activity, think mm -hmm. about it, and they're like, oh my gosh, I can read the electron configuration! And I was like, yes, good. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of thing. and. Recently, with elect I didn't know that you could do another kind of lab with electron configuration. They had nerds, and they put them in little boxes, and they got to see the different colored nerds means different color spins. 
And so I, it's a learning experience for me too, and I wish that I would have learned chemistry this way. But it is a blast. It is so much fun, and I couldn't imagine doing anything different. So oh, cool. thank you. <laughs> you're having the best experience teaching because you're having fun and you're learning all kinds of good things yourself. Oh, gosh. So that's yes. when it's great. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is very cool. Um, and the other fun thing for me is that I get a nerd out every single day. Um, for since it, since it is Mole Day, uh, I will tell everyone that there is last year's Mole Day theme song was Molar Eclipse of the Heart. Go use oh it. Oh my God! I died, and my students were like, "I, Miss K, I can't believe you just showed me this video." And then they were all laughing, and we were all singing it, and it was absolutely hilarious. So are they even um, old enough to know the original song? Yeah, no kidding. Are they? No, like but they could, sing it. they could sing it. They knew what the song was. So they knew the worth... song. Okay, they yes, still knew they it. Did. That's funny. They did know the song. So, oh um, yeah, I. That's why I think I love it so much, is because oh. I, I get to nerd out like that every single day. One of your kids made a t-shirt for you, I think, right? They did, yes. They made um, a t-shirt with their class color. That was in my ninth hour. They were royal blue, and she drew a mole on the front and had my name on the back. And they got so, some of my kids got so into mole, they, it was really cool to see that. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, they should. It's a party. Yes. Good. Well, it's just so surprising. At the beginning of the year, they all told me, I hate chemistry. And I was like, okay, sounds good. <laughs> like, I understand. Um so it was. It's neat to see them progress from "I hate it" to "I can stand your class now." It's okay. It's really fun. That sounds like they really like you, even if they don't like the material as much. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Oh, the power of the teacher. Yes. Go for it's it. Good. Yes. Hey, so, so what kind of technology do you have in your room? I'm just curious. Uh, technology-wise, yeah. um, I fun. have an Elmo and a projector, and then every teacher has a laptop. Past that, um, I'm trying to sneak in the veneer in there, of course. we. Are, I'm a veneer guru for everyone out there in the world. I love it. Um, so I'm trying to sneak some of that in mm -hmm. um, with some recent grant money that I got. But they have some veneer equipment. They use everything on laptops. Our physics, actually, just now, it's a one-to-one -one, um, tablet to student ratio for a, for a physics class. Just for physics. Okay. Yes. So mm -hmm. technology-wise, like computer-esque, those types of things in veneer, not a whole lot. Um, but in regards to access to lab equipment, lab materials, chemicals, endless for me. So it's it's good. You lost me at Elmo. What's an Elmo? Because <laughs> I'm oh. thinking the fuzzy red Sesame Street cat. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, an Elmo is a <laughs> document camera. So instead of having an overhead projector, I can just have a like a sheet of paper out. Right, right, right. Okay, I've seen those. Yeah. Oh, it comes in. It's so I think convenient. we have one at the STEM Center here, but I'm actually not sure. I don't know. Elizabeth it's probably, probably packed it. Yeah, Elizabeth, where is it? <laughs> um, I haven't seen the Elmo. Um, okay. Actually, things so have things have already moved a lot since you left. Yes. So that's what technology I do have. Somewhat limited, but um, we oh we have a, a case of laptops too for like you can check them out in the science department so every kid can have a laptop in class. Um, yeah. Sounds like you're pretty well stocked though. Oh yeah. Other I, materials and things. I feel really fortunate um, to have all of the the access that I do to things, um, and I've made mention to that to my staff as well is you know at another school I don't know if I could do all of these things mm -hmm. um, so I'm constantly trying to think about like how would you adapt this for maybe a school that doesn't have all the same materials and for some of those things you could still you could still make exceptions or find that YouTube clip there's a lot of great sites out there if you don't have access to it like interactive periodic table would be great um, mm -hmm. dot com that's a good one mm -hmm. where you could show those kinds of demos if you don't have access to uh, chemicals yeah that kind of thing so mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wanted to point out an earlier comment from Hugo Burnham from before the show that um, Phil Plate wrote a really great post about Mole Day okay. as a fantastic nerd holiday. So if you look at the comments in the event page, there's a link to that. Um, I like how he brings it back around to astronomy saying, did you know there are roughly a mole of stars in the visible universe? Oh. So there you go. There's the astronomy connection to moles. I will be sure to share that fun fact with my there class tomorrow. There you like go. It. Thank you so yeah. much. It's great. So, <laughs> count on the king of the nerds, Phil Plate, to uh, share that little bit with us online. So. Excellent. That's All right. 
Uh, I think we're going to wrap up, partly because I have to feel another coughing fit coming on. Okay. <laughs> Son of a gun. Okay, um, I am going to go through some last minute la uh, announcements, and then Elizabeth, if you can maybe end with some interesting, I don't know, message about teaching, being a new teacher, once I do the wrap up. Um, does that sound okay. good? I'll think about so, it, yeah. Okay, so uh, today's Wednesday, so Friday is the weekly space hangout, hosted by Fraser Kane at noon Pacific. Uh, check your check use timeanddate.com, my favorite website for finding your actual time time in the actual time zone that you're in. Um, so we'll go over the week space news. Uh, I should actually be there this week, so yay, I missed you guys. Um, Sunday night's virtual star party, I think it's at, uh, I don't know. We'll have to check the time on that because they've been pulling it back earlier and earlier thanks to the changing season. Um, so Sunday night's the virtual star party, and then Monday is astronomy cast that's also at noon Pacific. Uh, with um, Fraser Kane and Pamela Gay. And then next Wednesday, we'll be back here on Learning Space talking about the Cosmic Castaways Planetarium show and some of the uh, educational materials we've been working on to go along with that, uh, with that fun thing. So uh, stay tuned for that. So that's our announcements. I think my brain's fried. I'm going to go lay down. But it's Elizabeth... <laughs> Go. Oh, okay. Um, find something that you love and that you're passionate about uh, and enjoy it. So have a fire to inspire, as someone else once told me, and share that with someone else because it's rewarding and awesome. We, we, miss, we miss having your passion around the STEM Center, I have to say. Aww, we I miss you guys, too. Driving force for awesome. Granted, you don't want to be at the STEM Center right now because we are starting to pack up to move and... So I've heard. It's, it's a mess. <laughs> but yes. Get some great weightlifting experiences in there for you. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. But we miss you. So, And I'm really glad to hear having such a good time teaching. Thank you. And thanks for having me on the, this lovely little show. <laughs> I'm so glad the date worked out. <laughs> that, was, that was a great coincidence. You're like, I can do in October. We're like, oh my god, Molde. Oh my god. Molde. <laughs> it's, it's perfect. And it was great. I loved it. Cool. Oh, excellent. All right. Well, hey, we right. have to have you back, you know, in March. Um, there's another great holiday. Bye day. Yes. Bye, so, Bye day. Okay. You might want to come back around that time and on your own festivities. Sure, that would be fantastic. That's going on for Pi Day. I hope, I hope you don't do it at 3.14 a.m. No. <laughs> That's an after school thing now. Yeah, three three fourteen PM is is fine with me. That's good. That's reasonable. That's reasonable. All right. Thank you so yep. much. You have to come back. And okay. yes, thanks, Elizabeth. No problem. I'll see you guys soon, hopefully. Okay. Yay. Bye. 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 -bye.